we saw a lot of large numbers yesterday in the last lecture. Law of large numbers said that if we repeat an experiment n times, say the outcome of the experiment is represented by a random variable x. So we repeat the experiment n times and calculate the average of the outcome. In our case, it would be summation over xi, where each xi has the same distribution as x. If this is the case, then probability that x bar is away from the expectation by let's say an amount a is bounded by variance of x and a square. So we saw that as n tends to infinity, this goes to 0. This is going to 0 as 1 by n. And this was true for random variables x1 to xn when they were pairwise independent. So the family was pairwise independent. In this lecture, we will get a more stricter one in the sense that the approach to zero of the probability will be much faster. Though it will only be for specific kind of random variables. If we look at slightly smaller class of random variables than before, but for those kind of random variables, we get much better problems in the sense that the probability that our average is close to expectation, this is close to expectation, becomes much better. With very very high probability, this x bar is close to x. This is known as churn of power. This is one of applications in computer science. We will see one in the next lecture. But for today, we will see the statement of the theorem and the proof of it. So again, let's say an experiment is modeled by some random variable x. The outcome of the experiment, we call it the random variable x. In this case, we will keep a very, very simple random variable, which is with probability p gives value 1 and with probability 1 minus p gives value 0. If you remember, this is called Bernoulli's random variable. So we will stick to this and see that we get very, very strict norms on the probability. And this will show that there are a lot of implications of this thing. The first thing is define if we repeat this n times, say x1 to xn, denote by s as the summation of these random variables. So this is our setting. We have an experiment which is modeled by a random variable x. There are n copies of it, x1 up to xn. So they have the same distribution as x. Remember, x is a Bernoulli random variable. That means is 1 with probability p and 0 with probability 1 minus c. You remember that the expected value of x is equal to p. This implies that the expected value of s, which is summation over x i, is equal to. So we would like to believe that as n tends to infinity, random variable s approaches np with higher and higher probability. So Again, look at the constraints. x1 to xn in this case should be mutually independent. This is much stricter than pairwise independence, which we enforced for the law of large numbers. Sometimes this criteria that x1 to xn are copies of x, they are same distribution, and they are mutually independent are called as IIDs. We say that x1 to xn are IIDs if they are mutually independent and they have the same distribution. IID stands for independent and identically distributed. In the setting of the Chernobyl bounds, 
we have x1 to xn which are iids and each of them are Bernoulli rank variables with probability t defined by u as the expected value of s which is n times e of x in other words np so i will be using this expectation a lot that's why i am replacing it by a variable the statement of chernoff bomb says that the probability that the summation is less than 1 minus delta n e x is bounded by e to the minus n u and p u so the first thing to notice here is that the probability is going to zero as e to the minus n in the case of law of large numbers the probability was going down to zero as one by this rate of decrease is much much faster in the case of chart of form let's see the proof first and then we will talk about its implications we have to remember the setting that x1 to xn are iids uh, Bernoulli random variables and we want to talk about this new random variable s which is summation x the proof of Chernoff bound goes by looking at the random variable e to the minus ts. So this is the new random variable I am defining e to the minus t summation x. Here t is a parameter which we choose later. At this point, just keep it as a variable. Depending on the bound, we would want to optimize the bound, we want to give the best possible bound that will determine the value of. At this point, just say that t is a variable and we start with this random variable e to the minus t summation x. Okay, so first thing to convince yourself is that this is a random variable. This is a function of the random variables xi. So that's why it's a random variable itself. And we can apply all the bounds which we know till now on this random variable. So the first step would be to apply this bound Markov's inequality on the new random variable e to the minus ts. This will tell us that the probability that my sum is less than minus delta u is same as probability that e to the minus ts is it should not be less than, it should be greater than e to the minus t 1 minus delta u. So this just follows by the monotonicity of the function e to the minus tx. And now we notice that for this we can apply Markov's inequality. We wanted to bound probability that s is less than 1 minus delta to the u times u and we noticed that this is same as probability e to the minus t is greater than e to the minus t 1 minus and applying churn of bound here, this gives us expected value e to the minus t s. So, you should remember Markov's inequality by now. We have used it multiple times. And this is the bound which we get. There are multiple things to find out. What is e to the expected value of e to the minus t s? How to choose t? So let's first figure out the expected value of e to the minus t s. So what is s? S is summation x i. So expected value of e to the minus t s is same as expected value of t summation x i, which is same as expected value probability i equal to one to n to the minus ts. And if you remember the proof of law of large number, again we will use the fact that xi's are mutually independent. And once you know that these are mutually independent, this expectation can be put as a product of random variables. So this is the extension of what we saw yesterday. We saw that if the random variables were 
independent, then expected value of x and y was expected value of x multiplied by epsilon expected value of y. If they were mutually independent, then this could be generalized further, which we will be doing here. So we use critically the fact that x and y are IITs. Okay. So the thing now is to find the expected value of e to the minus t. So this is same as this. Right? So this is whole to the power n. And this requires a bit of calculation. This is to the p e to the minus t minus 1, which will imply. So they take this as an exercise. Prove this quantity. This will imply that expected value of e to the minus t s is less than or sorry, yeah, is less than e to the u minus t minus one. Now substituting this an expression above, this is where we would. This will tell us that the probability that s is less than 1 minus delta times u is less than e to the u. We get e to the minus t plus t 1 minus delta minus u. So there is a bit of calculation. That's why I am not doing it completely. I will leave it to you. But the important point is we are looking at the random variable e to the minus t s. Using Markov's inequality, we get this problem. And now, another important point to calculate expected value of e to the minus t s, we notice this formula and then we can split the expectation because x i s were mutually independent. So, this followed from the fact that x i s were i i t s. And once we have this formula, we can calculate it using standard methods and we get this. Now the last thing is to actually find a good value of t, substitute it there and simplify it. That will complete our proof. So I don't need to tell you this, but to maximize or to get the best form possible here, we just have to differentiate and find what value of t will work here. And you will see that t is equal to ln 1 by 1 minus delta is the the value which maximizes this. So I will just substitute this value. I will get probability that s is less than 1 minus delta u is less than e to the minus delta u divided by 1 minus delta u 1 minus delta. In other words, it is e to the minus delta delta 1 minus delta over to the u. At this point, you can already notice that this quantity is some constant, it just depends on delta, and then the entire thing goes as this big quantity to the power np. So this should be small, but let's make it more explicit by looking at I will just simplify 1 minus delta to the 1 minus delta. This is e to the uh, 1 minus delta ln 1 minus delta. And now I will use the Taylor expansion here. Putting the Taylor expansion here of ln 1 minus delta, we will get e to the power minus delta plus delta square by 2. Now, if you don't know, the extension, Taylor extension of n1 minus delta is minus delta minus delta square by 2 minus delta cube by 3 and so on. We will just ignore everything except these terms. And then we get this quantity. Substituting it here, we get that probability s greater than, uh, I'm sorry, s less than 1 minus delta times u is less than e to the minus delta square u by r. This is minus n p delta square. 
So we explicitly see that the probability goes down as e to the minus. So this is what we wanted to prove. In the special case of Bernoulli random variable, we got this part. By a similar method, the probability that s is greater than 1 plus delta times u can also be proven to be less than e to the np delta square. So this was our churn of bound. As we wanted to prove, we can use the same thing on the other side. Similar calculations, you should do it yourself and we will get this. Combining these two, we will get that probability S minus U is more than delta times U is very very small. It is less than 2 times E to the minus NP delta square. Again, I want to emphasize that the rate of probability going to 0, so this probability, remember this is expected value of S and this S is goes to be as very very fast because this quantity goes very very close to 0, very very fast and this is the main difference between law of large numbers. So when we applied law of large numbers, the probability was going to 0 as 1 by n. This is law of large number. For churn of bound, it goes to 0 as e to the minus. A good exercise for you to do this would be to say that if you toss a coin, let's say an unbiased coin, 1000 times, find the probability that you get less than 400. And you will see that this is very, very small. This goes to zero very, very quickly. So 1,000, if I put 2,000 times, and this is less than 900 heads or something, this will be very, very small. And the other exercise, which is also similar, now you toss a coin, but this time it's a biased one. Let's say 0.6 probability of getting a head. Again, 1,000 times. What is the probability that you get less than 500 heads or more than 700 heads? You can calculate this probability that the expected number of heads would be 600. So what is the probability that you are 100 away from expected number of heads? And you will see that this is very, very small. And this is the main strength of Chernoff form. It gives you very, very tough bounds on these special kind of experiments. We will see a particular application of this 